Hello, and welcome to this SimScale tutorial on the basics of meshing. Meshing is a fundamental part of any simulation type, and today we'll be looking at how we're going to generate that mesh and why it's so important. So, in order to start a mesh, you can see uh, I've selected the meshing tab here down towards the bottom of our simulation tree. Today we'll be looking at meshing this half valve that I've imported into the tool, as you can see here. So first off, why is simulation uh, so dependent on meshing and what exactly is a mesh? How the simulation works is we break down the overall domain into multiple smaller elements or volumes, if you will, as you can see here. We solve what are fairly simple equations across these volumes and similar to the resolution on our computer screen, what are fairly simple pieces come together to form a very beautiful picture overall. And again, like our, the resolution, if our mesh is too coarse, we're not going to capture all the crisp detail, the intricacies of the flow or um, FEA, whatever it may be. On the other hand, if our mesh gets really fine, it's going to capture all that detail, but it's going to be more expensive. So really, in the end of the day, meshing is about finding the balance between those two needs, uh, getting a mesh that is fine enough to capture everything that's relevant to us, what we need to know from this simulation, but at the same time, not spending more than we need to. So in order to get started with the meshing, I'm gonna move over to this meshing tab here. Here, you can see I've already generated a mesh. And today, I'll be showing you how to, to generate your own. First off, to start, you can create a new mesh by clicking the Create New Mesh button here, or let's say I'm really happy with this mesh, but I wanted to make a couple tweaks and use this as a baseline. I could even copy my mesh settings from a previous mesh that I've already generated. So to start off, we've got a couple questions to answer. The first being, which is the algorithm that we would like to use for this mesh? We have three, as you can see, the standard, the hex dominant, and the hex dominant parametric. I highly recommend using the standard measure, and today I'll be covering the different controls that we have for the standard measure. The standard measure is a TET-based measure. What does that mean? As you can see here, we're actually applying triangles and then turning them into tetrahedral across all of our surfaces. This gives us a very robust measure that's able to capture a lot of intricate detail near all the surfaces, um, and it runs right really quite quickly. So that's why I personally prefer it. Next up, I have to choose my sizing. So this is where we're gonna start playing with that cost versus accuracy that I was talking about. I can adjust my fineness of the mesh down here with this slider and either make a coarser mesh for maybe an earlier run where I just wanna get an idea of what's going on or a finer mesh. For example, when I'm trying to do my final production run and I really wanna know what the exact numbers are. If I prefer, rather than using the automatic uh, sizing, I can also switch over to manual. And then what I could do is actually select a maximum and minimum edge length, being the edges of these triangles here, for a little bit finer control on the overall density of my mesh. Other options we have. So we can set up automatic boundary layers. What are these? Next to any wall in a simulation, we expect to have a very uh, high gradient. We're going from typically a no-slip condition, meaning we have no velocity, into a fairly uh, chaotic flow in most cases. So what we like to do is we add a couple extra elements to really capture that transition. So as you can see here, I've added a couple boundary layers into my simulation, and that's going to be these kind of wafer-sized elements next to every wall. Here I can control the overall number of elements that I'm adding, the relative thickness next to the cell uh, adjacent. So in this case, for example, these three cells end up being about 40% of the next cell on average. And then the growth rate. So in this case, every cell is going to be 50 times larger than the one preceding it. I can turn this on and off. And this is basically just going to set it up for me on every no slip wall that I have within the simulation. Then we have the physics-based meshing toggle. This is going to just add some smart meshing to the mix, basically across any interface that I might have, any boundary condition, inlet, outlet. It's going to add some extra refinements for me automatically 
in order to make sure I have the resolution where it really counts. And then we have the hex element core, which is acting as you can see here in this little picture. What does that do? So as I mentioned, we are a TET-based measure. That being said, uh, TETs, while they're great for capturing surface detail, they're not quite as accurate as a hex cell. Um, so in what we try to do is blend the, both, the best of both worlds. TET does a lot better on our surfaces because it's easier to fit in places and gives us a better quality mesh near those complex details. But in the bulk, away from all the surfaces where it's relatively easy to fit in hex elements, we actually hollow out our mesh and just fill it up with these hex cells in order to get the accuracy of the hex where we need it, uh, but the robustness and capabilities of the TET where it really matters. After that, we can go to our advanced settings here. So we've got a couple. Small feature suppression is a really handy one. What this means is basically anything, any detail in our cat that falls under this threshold is going to be ignored. So let's say I had two, I was merging two faces. I thought they met perfectly, but in reality, there was a tiny gap in between them. What this is going to do, it's going to kind of automatically merge the two for me and do that smoothening that we need in order to get a high quality mesh. So what I would recommend is setting this value to something representative for your simulation. If you're working with something that's on the order of magnitude of say meters long, I wouldn't really be so concerned with anything on the, that's in the size of millimeters. On the other hand, if I was working with some microfluidics and everything was on the scale of millimeters, definitely I would want to adjust this uh, bring it lower so that I'm not coarsening out my simulation unnecessarily. Then we have the gap refinement factor. So this is really handy anytime I have small gaps in my simulation. If I want to, if I expect flow within that gap to be significant, uh, or I really want to capture that detail, what I can do is use this gap refinement factor and say about how many elements I want to ensure that I have across that gap. Uh, so this could be really handy, for example if I have a pitot tube, um, and I really want to make sure within that small gap, I add those extra elements. After that, we have the refinements tab. So here is where I can add a little bit more localized control, a little bit more fine control to the overall meshing process. So I'm going to open up the different mesh refinements that I have here. First off, we have the region refinement. So in this case, I only have the one volume, but I could select if I had multiple volumes, select each and every volume and assign a maximum edge length for that particular volume if I prefer. So in this case, maybe I want a one centimeter, for example, uh, maximum edge length within this overall volume. Also, I can create my own geometry primitive within the tool and let's say just create a quick sphere. And within that sphere, I can, again, adjust the fineness of my overall mesh. So let's say this was a region of particular interest to me. What I might do in this case is just actually bring it over to the valve itself. And now anything within this particular sphere is going to have that extra refinement, uh, while outside of the sphere will not be constrained by that refinement. The next refinement that I have is local element size. So this operates in a very similar manner, but now rather than defining a volume, I'm going to specify a particular face. And this again can be very handy for areas that I really want to make sure that I put my mesh because that's where you know the, the intricacy of the simulation is going to be. So one example that I like to use, let's say for example, I was working with a rotating piece of machinery. Typically, I will use this local element refinement on the surfaces of my blades uh, in order to really make sure that I have that extra mesh resolution near the blades, which are driving flow, where I expect there to be quite a bit of shear stresses. I'm probably also calculating the torque across those faces. So I want to make sure that I've got that mesh where it counts. On the other hand, I'm probably not adding that same level of mesh refinement down the pipe, for example, away from the pump, uh, where yes, the, the, the results matter, but it's not typically as complex of a flow. It's just a pipe flow. It's something a little bit simpler. It doesn't need quite as much mesh. So here again, I could set those mesh refinements across particular faces, for example. 
And then the last one we have is inflate boundary layer. So this acts exactly the same as those boundary layers that I was telling you about earlier. The only difference here is now I get control on exactly which face. So let's say, for example, I have, um, again, a piece of rotating machinery. I used my overall boundary layers everywhere, and I just set up three, which is the default, tends to handle most cases quite nicely. But across those blades, again, I wanted higher mesh detail. I wanted to really capture what's going on. I might then override sort of the global that I had placed earlier and select just those blade faces and add, you know, six mm, layers instead. Um, and add again, yeah, just a little bit more mesh detail where it's needed. And one thing to note here, so the, this plays nicely with using the overall global setting. Uh, what it's going to do is it's going to override my global setting. So I don't have to sacrifice setting up the the, the elements everywhere uh, just to get it on a couple particular faces with uh, additional refinements. I can just override the global one and apply the specific refinements to those faces. And that is meshing within a nutshell uh, on the platform. And the next tutorial will be covering how am I going to judge whether my mesh is good or bad and what I can do to address that. Thank you. Bye-bye.